flipping coins. In Litecoins, we feel the more items there are to flip, in this case the atoms, the closer to a predicted amount that turn over with each successive flip. In other words, if you have only one coin to flip, you have no idea whether it's going to be heads or tails. In fact, the odds are 50-50. Not good odds. But if you flip two coins at the same time, the odds are now slightly better that at least one coin will turn over. If you had a million coins, then you can be almost certain half will turn over if you were to flip them all at the same time. The classic experiment proving the law of probability was done by mathematician John Carrick, who tossed a coin 10,000 times while interned in a prison camp in Denmark during World War I. At various stages of the experiment, the relative frequency would climb or fall below the theoretical probability of 0.5. But as the number of tosses increased, the relative frequency tended to vary less and stay near 0.5 or 50%. Carrick recorded the number of heads within each set of 10 flips. In his first 10 flips, the coin landed heads up four times for a relative frequency of 0.4. In the next 10 flips, he observed six heads, bringing his overall relative frequency back closer to 0.5. After 30 tosses, the proportion of heads was 0.567. After 200 tosses, it was 0.502. With this small number of tosses, the proportion of heads fluctuates. But after 10,000 tosses, Carrick counted a total of 5,067 heads for a relative frequency of 0.5067, which is really close to the theoretical probability of 50-50, or batting 500. Like Carrick's test, each year my students get boxes with 100 M&Ms per group, all M's facing down. They shut the lid and shake the box once. This is called a half-life because you would expect half to turn over when you shake it. They reach in to pull out all the M's that turned over to face upwards. We call these M's that we take out the daughters. The analogy being that the M's facing down are like the radioactive atoms and the M's that turn over are the daughters. They go through four half-lives. In this case, each half-life is a shake of the box. The first is with 100 M and M's. When they plot the amounts of parents and daughters at each half-life, they generate the same graph as the law of probabilities and the law of radioactivity. Then they do the same probability experiment with 50 M&Ms, then 25, and finally only 10. We find that when there are more M&Ms, the closer to the actual curve and the less out of whack are their experimental graphs. What we proved is that when there are more items, each with an equal chance of being turned over, or turned into a daughter, then the more likely you're able to predict how many turned over on the next half-life shake, and the next, and the next. The ultimate goal for all of this probability testing is to realize that there are billions and billions of radioactive atoms in any given sample that a scientist tests. Therefore, they can be reasonably sure of any predictions that they make on their decay graph, even when going well beyond human or geologic timescales. They're so sure that it's one of science's laws. The law of radioactivity. Since one can analyze the percentages of parent and daughter elements in a rock or any sample using a spectral analyzer or a mass spectrometer, and the rate of decay can be measured by any of the counting methods, like the cloud chamber or Geiger counter, the age of that object can be determined. The way that is done is finding the percentages of the parent and daughter element in the clump of matter in question. If it's 100% parent element, it's zero time, because as soon as the time clock starts, the parent begins to decay. So that would mean less than 100% parent, if only slightly. Then if it decays down to 50% parent and 50% daughter, since it has decayed halfway, its age is appropriately named one half-life. With the law of radioactivity, you can say, since there is this amount of parent and this amount of daughter in the sample, it must have decayed for this long. But what people have difficulty believing is that we seem to have some elements with half-lives much older than our current understanding of the Earth's age or even the current estimate for the age of the universe. How could we know that? Well, remember the tree rings? We can be relatively sure of the age of some pieces of wood that date back to between 20,000 and 50,000 years. In 1949, Willard Libby invented the radiocarbon dating method that would use the percentage of parent element carbon-14 
and its non-radioactive daughter, nitrogen-14, from a sample and be able to determine the age of the sample. It was assumed that the cycle of carbon-14 and nitrogen-14 creation and decay caused by cosmic rays colliding with nitrogen in the atmosphere remained constant throughout time, at least as long as the atmosphere had been able to sustain life. That meant one could calibrate the law of radioactivity by looking for a tree ring sample that had exactly half carbon-14 and half nitrogen-14. They promptly found it, and a tree ring exactly 5,730 years old was one half-life because it contained exactly 50% carbon-14 and 50% nitrogen-14. Then a tree ring exactly 11,460 years old was two half-lives, and 17,190 years had gone through three half-lives. So the law of radioactivity was proven yet again and calibrated pretty solidly since each successive half-life was the perfect sum of the previous. And now to something really old like dinosaurs or the age of the earth. All you have to do is find the percentage of parent and daughter elements that have long half-lives in a fossil or rock sample like uranium or often for dinosaur bones, potassium-40. Recently, geologists found rocks from Canada in an area on the eastern shore of Hudson Bay in northern Quebec that formed 4.28 billion years ago. That's 250 million years older than any other known rocks. They used a new instrument called a thermal ionization mass spectrometer to measure the percentages of parent and daughter elements. But of course, with plate tectonics and an active mantle, the fact that the crust continues to recycle as it plummets back into the earth, about a centimeter per year in most places, perhaps it's older than the oldest rocks. It could be infinitely old, since we can't know how many times the surface of the earth might have recycled itself. So, somebody had the brilliant idea to double check with moon samples. If we could find the oldest moon rocks, then the moon, not having a liquid mantle and not recycling its surface like the Earth, and assuming the moon's age is probably close to the Earth's, the oldest rocks found there could lead us to our lovely planet's age. So during the Apollo missions to the moon from 1969 to 1972, astronauts collected 2,414 samples of moon rocks weighing 383 kilograms or 842 pounds. One of these rocks collected in 1971 during Apollo 15 was named the Genesis Rock. It is the oldest known piece of lunar crust having formed as the moon cooled and solidified over 4 billion years ago. Now most scientists agree on a 4 to 5 billion year range for the age of the Earth. And that concludes this podcast on how do we know how old things are. From Mr. Crowder's world to you.